During our lifetime, we are likely to face billions of different infectious microorganisms, displaying trillions of antigenic determinants on their surface. That will trigger a defensive response from our body. There are two main types of defensive responses, those involving the innate immune system and those involving the adaptive immune system. Innate immune responses are non-specific, meaning they involve the use of proteins that are active against a wide range of infectious organisms. Two good examples of innate immune responses are the activation of the complement cascade and the production of interferon. Interferon is a major antiviral effector. Innate immune responses are specific and involve the action of proteins displaying the ability to attack specific infectious agents. There are two main types of effector molecules within the adaptive immune system, antibodies and T-cell receptors. Both antibodies and T-cell receptors have the ability to recognize only one type of antigenic determinant or molecular shape in the surface of the infectious agent that triggered their production. The incredible specific specificity exuded by antibodies and T-cell receptors is provided by its molecular components, a heterodimer formed by two different protein chains. Antibodies provide three main functions, neutralization of toxins, and a good example of this is when you are bitten by a snake, the antivenom that you are given is an antibody that neutralizes the toxin. Opsonization, which is the ability of antibodies to coat bacteria and other infectious agents, therefore making it easier for phagocytic cells in your body to engulf them and eliminate them. And the last function provided by antibodies is the formation of immune complexes. Those immune complexes may trigger the activation of other proteins, such as those of the complement cascade, and lead to the formation of pores in the microorganism targeted, therefore killing it. At this point, I hope you might be intrigued about how do we generate the large variety of antibodies that are needed to specifically recognize the trillions of antigens that you may face in a lifetime. To answer this question, we must first look at the overall architecture of the immunoglobulin or antibody molecule. Antibodies form a letter Y that allows them to have two antigen binding sites, one at each upper arm of the Y letter. Each arm of the antibody molecule is formed by a copy of the same structure. In fact, the body of an antibody is made of two copies of the same structure, the joining of two different proteins, one light chain, represented by the letter L, and one heavy chain, represented by the letter H. There are two copies of L and two copies of H in every antibody molecule, as shown here. Notice how one half is identical to the other half. And notice how the upper ends of the L and H chains look like fingers. Those fingers are the regions that will be involved on handling or binding the antigen and therefore are indicated by the so-called antigen binding sites in the figure. It would be physically impossible for us to have one gene for every antibody molecule produced by our body. For that to be possible, our genome would have to code for billions of genes. And keep in mind 
our genome only codes for about 23,000 different genes. So instead of having individual genes for every antibody produced, we use a single set of L or light chain genes and a single set of H or heavy chain genes to produce the large number of antibodies that we make. The fingers that are present in the L chain are encoded by the combination of two sets of fragments within the L gene, the V or variable fragment and the J or joining fragment. There are 250 V fragments that can combine with any of the four different J fragments. That combination occurs by a gene rearrangement that positions one of the B fragments right next to one of the J fragments. The other V and J fragments located in between the selected V and J fragments are lost. The L gene is then transcribed to generate an immature or primary messenger RNA transcript that is later spliced to generate the mature immunoglobulin messenger RNA or mRNA for the light chain, L chain. This mature messenger RNA is then translated to generate the light chain of the antibody. The rearrangement of the V and J segments involves the formation of a loop in the structure of the DNA. This loop facilitates the excision of the interceding region and the joining of the V and J segments chosen. Notice how the V and J segments located between the selected ones are lost in the form of a circle. Notice also how the rearrangement of the gene coding for the light chain occurs in B cells, not in undifferentiated germline cells. The rearrangement of the gene coding for the other part of the antibody molecule, the heavy chain, is very similar, but involves a third segment, the D or diversity segment. It is important to note that the length of the immature heavy chain gene is too long, way too long, to allow the enhancer, which drives the expression of the gene, to be active. Therefore, the heavy chain gene is transcribed efficiently only after it has been rearranged. The rearrangement of the H chain involves First, the joining of one segment calling for the D region with one segment calling for the J region. Notice that there are 12 different D gene segments, any of which can be chosen, and four different J segments, any of which can also be chosen, therefore providing for 48 different combinations. The next stage involves the joining of one of the V segments with the pre-joined D and G J's gene segments. There are 500, 500 different B gene segments, therefore increasing the number of potential combinations up to 24,000. Once the V gene segment is joined to the D J segment, the gene is transcribed and spliced to then produce a mature messenger RNA calling for a single heavy chain that now has to be combined with one of the potential thousand different combinations that are possible for the light chain, therefore generating a total of about 24 million different antibodies. Additional variability, which by the way is needed due to the high number of possible potential infectious organisms that we will face, is provided by the molecular nature of the process itself, therefore producing the needed range of antibody variability.
The rearrangements involved in the maturation of the antibody genes are driven at the molecular level by a very small segment of sequence identity. These very small segments of sequence identity are recognized by the RAC genes, the so-called recombination activating genes, a set of genes that trigger the binding of the B and D segments selected during the process, and that also enhances the cleavage and rejoining of the broken coding strands. In this process, the cuts and seals involved in the process are error-prone and therefore may lead to the introduction of mutations that increase the variability of the product generated. Furthermore, upon cleavage, the broken DNA usually undergoes the addition of additional bases, extra bases that are added thanks to the activity of an enzyme known as terminal deoxynucleotide transferase. Terminal deoxynucleotide transferase, also known as TDT. By the way, TDT and the RAC genes are enzymes that are exclusively produced in lymphocytes, B and T cell lymphocytes. Now, the addition of the extra nucleotides that is provided by the terminal deoxynucleotide transferase provides further variability to the process, therefore increasing the number of antibodies that are generated. Here, the variability of the mechanism involved in joining the broken ends of DNA generated during the process is emphasized. It is easy to see how further variability is generated in the process. The last source of variability is driven by the same mechanism that drives the process of class switching. Antibodies can have different identities depending upon the heavy chain that they carry. Therefore, antibodies can be of the G, A, D, E, and M type. Antibodies are produced by B cells, also known as B lymphocytes. During the maturation process of a B cell, the light and heavy chain genes are rearranged as previously indicated. During that process, the first set of heavy chain gene segments will always involve the use of a heavy chain of the M type as the first choice. Therefore, all B cells produce immunoglobulin M early on. But later, the B cell will undergo a process that will allow it to produce all types of immunoglobulins. Most B cells will go on to produce IgG, whereas some will go on to produce the other types of antibodies. Type of antibody produced is dictated by the constant region of the heavy chain. The type of antibody dictates the ideal function that will be executed by the immunoglobulin molecule. IgM or immunoglobulin M is particularly good at activating complement. AGA is the main type of antibody present in secretions such as saliva, tears, mucus, and even the milk in breastfeeding mothers. And therefore, circuitry immunoglobulin A is referred to as the circuitry immunoglobulin. IgE is associated with allergic reactions, and it's quite efficient at activating eosinophils, which are the immune cells that are involved in killing certain human parasites, such as nematodes. IgG is multifunctional and is the most abundant type of immunoglobulin. The process that drives heavy chain switch, also known as class switch, involves the expression of an enzyme that is expressed only in B and T cell lymph cells, B and T cells or B and T lymphocytes. This enzyme is known as 
activation induced cytosine deaminase or AID. This enzyme, as the name indicates, deaminates cytosine residues in the region where the B, D, G, and J gene segments meet the gene segment calling for the constant region over a short sequence known as the switch region or S region. The deamination of cytosines turns cytosines into, into uracils. And this change triggers the activation of the base excision repair pathway, as we had seen previously in class. Therefore, leading to the formation of numerous breaks or nicks on the backbone of the DNA, some of which affect both DNA strands. This, in turn, triggers the switch from one constant gene segment to another. In the process, the genes located in between the regions that are being connected are lost in the form of circular DNA fragments, leading to the formation of a fully rearranged mature immunoglobulin gene. The activity of the AID enzyme also triggers further changes in the sequence of the variable region in a process known as somatic hypermutation. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the two mechanisms by which DNA recombination may take place. Take a few seconds to read it and Keep the differences in mind as they are important and will, will help increase your understanding of the two types of events.